we're starting a series in the month of July that we're, we're calling it Living with Purpose. And if you're following with us through the Bible Engagement Project app under the Listen curriculum, you'll see that there's purpose and then there's uh, David and Goliath on this week. And uh, we looked kind of the last couple of weeks at King Saul, his rise to be the king and then his demise as the king. And if you remember, uh, God said to Samuel, the prophet, the one that was leading at that time in the land of Israel, uh, he said, hey, the, the people, they're not just rejecting you, Samuel, they're rejecting me as their king by asking for this guy uh, that would become Saul, that, that would become the king, asking for a king. And, and it says this in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the people respond to Samuel's word to them and they say, we want a king over us and we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. And ultimately, Saul, the first king, his, his, his heart was not for the Lord. His pride, his, his disobedience, it got the best of him. And God's hand, God's anointing was removed from him. And Samuel the prophet tells us that uh, Saul, the, the, or he goes and tells Saul that the Lord has sought a man after his own heart and that his time was coming to an end. And, and he's already appointed a new man, Samuel says. And, and it tells us at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 15 that, the, that, that Samuel never went back to see Saul again and he mourned for Saul after that moment. I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes looking at David about killing giants. Uh, and, and how many are familiar with the story of David and Goliath? I think uh, even if you have never been to church, the, the majority of people still in America have heard this story of this guy that killed a giant with a slingshot. And uh, in the, I, I read this week, earlier in the week, in the 1950s, there was a professor at Johns Hopkins that uh, he did a famous experiment with some rats. And he put one set of rats in this bucket full of water to see how long they could survive before they drowned. And then he, he uh, noted how long uh, before they died. He took notes and, and did all his research stuff and PETA probably like tried to sue him and all that stuff. But someone's like, he needs to come to my house because I got a couple of rats. Uh, he put another set of rats into this same bucket full of water. He observes them. And just before they were about to drown, he got them out of the bucket and he lets them completely recover. Then he puts them back in the bucket and guess what happens? They lasted much longer swimming around. Why? The, the professor kind of explains to people through the study, he believes that it's because they had hope. He believes that these rats, they, they had experienced deliverance from the bucket of water before and they realized the possibility of deliverance again and that hope gave them something really important it gave them purpose and that purpose led them just like the old Disney movie said to keep on swimming church can I tell you today if you're a believer walking with Jesus you've experienced deliverance Maybe you don't even realize it, but the sin that you were dead in, he has delivered you from that and you have hope for eternity. And when you have that deliverance that only Jesus can bring, it should bring hope to your life. And the hope that you're now walking in gives us purpose, especially in the tough seasons we walk in in life. Often church can, and you know this if you walk with Jesus, there are giants in our lives that would threaten our purpose and try to steal our hope. There was a Holocaust survivor and Nobel Prize winner, uh, Elie Wiesel, that, that wrote the question, why are we here? He said this, the question, why are we here, is the most important question a human being has to face in their life. It's a question about purpose. Ultimately, uh, if you're a believer today, our purpose comes down to glorifying our creator. The Westminster Catechism says it like this, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And within the time that we have here on this earth as it is right now, God, it's, it's so beautiful. God uses our gifts and our uniqueness as individuals as a part of his greater purpose. And he'll give us these, these moments of purpose or calling within our lives to glorify him. So I wanna, I wanna take a few minutes and look at David through the lens of of some things that, that I would say they try to kill our purpose and steal our hope. So I wanna take you to where David first comes on the scene. If you could turn with me to 1 Samuel 16. Anybody bring a Bible to church on a Sunday morning? Praise God, all you spiritual people in the room. Anybody bring your phone Bible to church on a Sunday morning? That's okay too. Anybody bring no Bible? That's okay too. We're gonna have it on the giant Bible. This is what it says, 1 Samuel 16, 
when, uh, let me give you some context first. God tells Samuel, go to, the, go to Bethlehem, go to the house of Jesse, and one of his sons uh, is gonna be the king. And so Jesse, they go to Jesse, they, he lines up all the sons, and it says this, when, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, and this is the oldest son, tallest son, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here. In verse seven, it tells us, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at, praise God. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And it says in verse eight, then Jesse calls Abinadab and, and it goes on and tells us that all of the sons, they start passing in front of Samuel and, it's, and God's like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> nope, it's not that one. And, 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 and Jesse, sorry, Samuel looks at Jesse, says, hey, is this all of the sons? I'm, I'm confused. God told me to come here. I don't know what's happening. And Jesse answers, well, there's still the youngest. He's out there in the fields tending the sheep. Isn't it crazy? The dad didn't even, he didn't even consider him a son in that moment. And Samuel says, send for him. We'll not sit down until he arrives. And he sent for him. He brought him in. He was glowing with health and he had a fine appearance and handsome features. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David powerfully. Now, what's happening is Saul, the anointing had left him. The anointing is now on David long before he ever even becomes king. And now we go to chapter 17, the next chapter in 1 Samuel, and Israel's at war with these people called the Philistines. And what's happening is the Philistines are invading the land that God had given to his people. The Israelites had fought multiple times already against the Philistines through the years, and they had beat them, and they won different battles. And so they should have this hope, like, man, we can destroy these guys. Like, no big deal. We'll, we'll beat them again. We'll, we got God. We'll drive them out. And it should have given them purpose. But at this point, remember, Saul's anointing is gone. He's not the leader that he should be in this moment. They're not trusting and walking with the Lord. And the enemy has this giant named Goliath that everybody's afraid of. So 1 Samuel 17, watch what Goliath says. Goliath comes out and he's yelling at all the men of Israel. He says, choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you'll become our subjects and serve us. In verse 11, it goes on to tell us, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all of the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. In their fear, they had lost hope. How many know that in our fear, so often we lose hope? So often when, when we lose hope, when we stop walking in purpose, what, I mean, what do we do? We, we become paralyzed, we do nothing. We, we, we succumb to the anxiety of whatever it is that we're walking through. That's what happened here day after day. In verse 16, it tells us for 40 days, the Philistine comes forward and every morning and, and evening, he took his stand. Now they had already invaded the land. They were already in a place where they shouldn't have been. And it's, he's basically just taunting them for 40 days. The Israelites originally came to the battlefield with a purpose to fight, but because of Saul, because of no godly leadership, they lose hope, they lose purpose, the land's being invaded. And, and how, many, how many of us in, in this room, I mean, in the 21st century, so many years later, have had a moment where it's like there's a giant in your life, something going on. Maybe it's not a literal person that's gonna kill you, but there's a giant in your life financially. There's a giant in your life relationally. There's maybe somebody today, there's a giant in your life with your relationship with your kids or something going on with your kids or there's a giant uh, in your life in your marriage right now. There's, there's some kind of past trauma that you're dealing with or haven't dealt with and it becomes paralyzing and it tries to steal your hope and messes with your purpose. I wanna just encourage somebody in the room today that because of the God that we serve, that created the universe and knows you better than you know yourself, there is no giant that's too big for him. And there is hope in the midst of whatever you're walking through or whatever you will walk through, you serve a God that if he called you to it, he's gonna get you through it. I, I wanna just share for just a couple minutes, three things or three giants that I, I would call them that, that can try to rob you of your purpose that can maybe try to make you lose sight of why you're here. Some thoughts, some, some, some principles that surround David's story. The first one is this, the giant of distraction. How many know we can be distracted in the world that we're living in today? 
Some of y'all are distracted right now and you didn't even hear me say it because we're living in a world of distraction. We live in the age of distraction if you have one of these. In fact, Siri just tried to talk to me while I picked it up. <laughs> distraction, how many know it can create like laziness in your life? It can create procrastination. Some of y'all are like, I'm, I, I know what you're saying. I, I, told, I told my wife I was going to bed at 9.30 and then I found myself on Facebook till 12.30 just last night. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying I did that, I'm saying someone else did that. <laughs> I was trying to sleep, I had to get up early. Distraction, it, it's, it can affect us. It's, I mean, for somebody in the room, it's like, well, now that I have 573 unread text messages, I'm just never gonna answer one again. Like I've dug my hole deeper and deeper and deeper. Maybe you're just distracted by, by the things of life and, and this was the year that you were, you were on your Dave Ramsey grind and, and you had the Every Dollar app and, and I'm not talking about myself, I promise. And you went to Barrio Queen five times last month because you love their chips and all of a sudden your budget was busted. And distraction messed up your whole thing. We, we live in a time where, where on a deeper level, we really can get distracted from the things that God's called us to. And maybe it's simply the call to be the, 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 the spiritual leader of your home, man, that God has called you to be. Maybe it's the call to be the parent that you're called to be and stop letting the government raise your kids or the school raise your kids and, and be a person that is nurturing and leading them into the things of the Lord. Maybe... Maybe it's the call to say, man, I'm actually gonna own my faith and I am gonna take the, the, the next step and I am gonna get baptized and I am gonna get, get in recovery or get some help and move forward with the things that God has called me to in my life. Or maybe I'm gonna, I am gonna answer that call to share my faith like Jesus commands us to do, to go and to make disciples. And, and I wonder when the last time that we shared our faith was. Distraction. Now in the context of the story of David and Goliath, most of us, know in the room today that he used a slingshot to take this guy out when it gets down to it. And, and I wanna show you a photo real quick, just so you can kind of see, uh, this is what the rocks would have, I don't know why the tennis ball, well, I guess it's for sizing, but the rocks would have actually been close to the size of a tennis ball that they would have used in the ancient Near East. And what would happen, and I got a slingshot that's supposed to be really close to what they would have used with a leather pouch and some kind of braided rope or animal hair, but what they would have done is they're like, different styles of swinging these things and throwing rocks out of them. But because of ancient manuscripts and then science actually testing these things today, people that were experienced with a sling would throw these rocks over a hundred miles an hour. So it was like Randy Johnson out of the sling every single time. People under 30 are like, who's Randy Johnson? <laughs> um, World Series pitcher. The other thing is they would be accurate for hundreds of yards. There was one thing that I was reading that said they could be accurate with one of these for like over 400 yards, which is crazy because I can only shoot my bow like 50 yards. <laughs> Here's what's interesting. There was a tribe in Israel that was especially good at using a sling. It was the tribe of Benjamin. And what we see in the scripture in Judges chapter 20 is that Benjamin actually mobilizes for war at this period in their history. And it says among all the soldiers, there were 700 select troops who were left-handed. Any left-handed people today? Praise God for you. Each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. In other words, they had deadly accuracy as they went into battle. Now, David was from the tribe of Judah. Who's from the tribe of Benjamin? King Saul, the most prominent person of all of Israel is part of this tribe that were trained in the art of using a sling for protection or for battle. And so who should have been out there fighting Goliath? Saul, who should have stepped forward and said, no, no, I am gonna trust God and he is gonna win this battle. And, and what did the people even say when they first wanted a king? We want a king that's gonna lead us into battle. And he's hiding in his tent. This was Saul's tribe's special skill. I mean, you could, you could say in, that, in war, it was almost like their special calling. Saul's not out there, why? Because he had gotten distracted. And as I studied the life of Saul and his character, he had lost his way and there's pride and there's disobedience, there's all those things, but what had distracted him, it was the praise of men. When Samuel confronted Saul for his sin, a couple chapters before what we're looking at, Saul, 
at the end of it, he says, yeah, I messed up, but, but, but Samuel, can you, can you make sure that the people honor me and the elders honor me and, and, and you speak well of me? He cared more about being honored and what people thought of him than what God thought of him and what God was calling him to do. It was the fear, it was the praise of man that he was obsessed with and the fear of man that it had overtaken him. Proverbs 29, five says it this way about the fear of man, the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. And I had this thought as I studied Saul's life that the praise of men leads to the fear of men, but the fear of God keeps you praising God and glorifying God. Saul's distracted, he's sidetracked, he's derailed by his fear of, of people, by caring too much about what other people thought. He avoided what he was anointed to do and it led to the loss of his anointing completely. If the fear of man that, that can distract people is the problem, I would tell you today and encourage you today that the solution for all of us is to live with a healthy fear of the Lord. When we fear the Lord, here's what happens. We become fearless of other things in our life, of giants in our life. When you fear the Lord, you realize that, yeah, Goliath over there, my God's a lot bigger, I don't care. And that's what David does. Watch this in verse 32 of chapter 17. David comes on the scene and he says to Saul, let no one lose heart Saul should have been the one to say this, but David says it, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine, your servant will go and fight him. David's like a whippersnapper at this point. Verse 37, it goes on to say that, that David says, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear while he was tending his sheep, he'll also rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Then in verse 45, David says to the Philistines, so he goes out on the battlefield to meet Goliath. He says, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. What's happening here? David's not just saying, yeah, I'm gonna... I'm pretty good with the sling, I'm gonna go give it a shot. No, he's saying, I'm realizing that I'm part of the, the army of God, God's people that are supposed to be a blessing to all of the nations. And this guy didn't just diss us, he dissed the God that we serve. So we're gonna have to take care of him. God's gonna have to take care of him. David says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. In other words, it's not just about us getting the glory as an army. The world will know that there is a God and you just defied him and dishonored him. And David, it says in verse 47, all those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord. Somebody today, you need to be encouraged that it is not by your own power, not by your own strength, not by whatever you think that's gonna get you through what you're walking through. The, ultimately, the battle in your life is the Lord's. And so it should encourage you to say, God, I'm gonna trust in you that if you call me to it again, you're gonna get me through it. The battle is yours. My faith is in you, Lord. That's the fearlessness that comes from a fear of the Lord, of walking with the Lord, a trust in the Lord. That's, that's the fearlessness that, that kills distraction, that, that finds purpose. I wanna, I, what I'm trying to say to somebody is don't avoid what you're anointed to do today. If you're a parent in the room, you have become anointed to lead your specific family and raise up your kids. Don't avoid what you're anointed to do. If you're a husband in the room, that person you're married to is now your person according to the Bible and you're anointed to be the best husband with God's help that you can be and lead your family and your wife in the ways of the Lord. Don't avoid what you're anointed to do. Whatever that might be from the small and the large. Verse 48, I love what it says. As the Philistine moved closer to attack David, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet him. He reached into his bag, he took out a stone, he slung it, he struck him in the forehead. It sunk into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. David, if you, if you read it, he would go on to do just as he said and he, go, he goes up, takes Goliath's sword and cuts off his head. God gets the glory, powerful moment. David should have never been there. Another thought though from so the, the kind of the surrounding story of David's life is not just distraction, but there's a giant of discontent. I think in the um, materialistic world that we live in, it's really easy, or the, 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 just the fast pace of our world, it's really easy to get stuck with discontent. You can be discontent in, in different seasons of our life. And it can show itself in a lot of ways, but maybe even you walked in the room today and you're looking at your current moment, your current season, and you're saying, God, why me? <laughs> 
Why is this happening? Why this? I, why this right now? Where is all this going? I don't understand. And it shows itself as you read 1 Samuel in the voices that are around David that there is some discontentment. When David shows up to the battle, what we see and remember Eliab, his brother, didn't get anointed to be king, but he sees this happen to David. It tells us in verse 28 of 1 Samuel 17, when Eliab, the oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger and he said, David, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those sheep in the wilderness? In other words, bro, get back to your little sheep. You shouldn't be where the big boys are. I know, and he says this, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. He's attacking him because that's not true. You came down just to watch the battle. He's saying, who do you think you are, David? You're not ready for this. You're not in that season. Get out of here. You shouldn't be here. Then in verse 33, Saul says, you're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. He's been a warrior from his youth. Same thing. Saul's saying, you're not in that season. You can't do it. You're in the wrong seat. You're way too young. You're not ready for this. It's interesting though that David responds and deeply disagrees in this moment because he sees that in fact, God had been preparing him for a long time for this season in his life, for this moment. And here's my thought for you today is that David, before he was ever on a platform as a king, on his throne as a king, before he was ever on, a, on his stage as being a strong warrior and battling, he was out in the fields with his sheep and he was taking something like this in his staff and he was saying, oh, this bear is gonna come attack me, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rip that thing apart. I'm gonna protect somebody. I should have brought something to, to like see who it would knock out today. I probably miss, honestly. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, Lord, it was because he, never mind. Before David ever stepped into the next season, he was taking care of the flock. Before David ever protected the flock of Israel, he protected those flock of sheep that God had placed him in for that moment in, in, in that season, that moment in time. He refused to be defeated by the giant of discontent so many times in his life. And yeah, he struggled, there was moments, but I know this, that David believed that God was in one season preparing him for the next. I mean, he had this confidence that God was going to work in that moment and help him and if you read the Psalms, you see some of the things that he thought through the years and the wrestling that he had. But I just want to encourage you. You would say, well, how do I kill the giant of discontent in my life? I don't understand this season. I don't understand this moment. I mean, what could God even be preparing me for? I'm, I'm in this dead end moment and job and, and struggle over here. What, what could God do? I want to just encourage you. Look at your present in light of your past and say, God, how are you preparing me? And how have you prepared me to fight this battle that I'm in right now? And if you look just a little bit at your past, you realize if you've been walking with Jesus, praise God that I'm, I may not be where I wanna be, but I'm not where I used to be. And God, I know that your grace is helping me. I would also encourage you to believe that your current season, no matter how confusing, no matter how unexpected, whatever is going on, Believe that and have faith that in some way, God, you are preparing me for the future. But listen, Jesus said there's enough worries in the future. Focus on today. So God, give me the grace I need today and my future is in your hands. Rest in the fact that God is working. Rest in the fact that he said in his word in Romans chapter eight, that he is working all things out for the good of those that are called according to his purpose. I got one more thought for you. The giant of identity. There, there, there's, there's discontent and discouragement and, and some of those things in our life, but, but man, one of the greatest attacks, I mean, look at what's happening with people's identity in our country today. One of the greatest attacks of the enemy is he doesn't want people to understand that, that man, he created people with dignity and he created men and he doesn't make a mistake and women and he doesn't make a mistake and marriage is a beautiful thing between a man and a woman and there's all this confusion and it goes deeper than that. And, and there's this danger, church, still today, in living every day, letting other people tell us who we should be. Like letting peers say, you need to be that, you need to be this, coworkers, you need to do that, culture, you need to do this, you need to do that, this is what you need to believe. Parents, maybe that are well-intending or not well-intending, saying, well, I think you need to do this. And, and, and culture would say, yeah, yeah, you, you need to be, follow your heart, be who you need to be. And, and, and there's some truth to say that, that man, yeah, you probably shouldn't listen to every other voice, but culture gets it wrong when, when people start to say, yeah, follow your heart. Well, the Bible says your heart is deceitful. Don't trust your own heart. You only need to trust the heart of God. What I'm trying to say is 
yes, other people shouldn't define you and put things on you that are not what God has called you to, but don't get stuck in the place believing that you just need to decide and, and your heart, trusting your heart is gonna work. It doesn't, God defines us. The one who made every single aspect of who you are, who made you and created you with great wisdom and skill and love, the one that he sent his son who shed his blood for you, your creator, your redeemer, he knows you better than you know yourself. He cares for you more than you care for yourself. That's why God gets to tell you who you are, who you should be and what you're called to in your life because he cares and knows you even better than you do. David knew this. And he writes at some point in his life, in Psalm 139, David wrote this, you perceive my thoughts from afar. He said, God, you're familiar with all of my ways. He said in verse 13 of, of Psalm 139, God, you created my inmost being. God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God, you knew, this is why protecting life is important. God, you knew while I was still in the womb, you were forming me. David had, had this realization of his place as a child of God. Here's what's interesting in the story of David and Goliath. After David convinces Saul that he can defeat Goliath, guess what Saul immediately tries to do? He, he tries to define David. He tries to, he's like, okay, you need to wear my armor. You need to use my sword and, and my javelin. And, and, and he weighs him down with all this stuff and he, and he dresses him up and, and, and he's saying, this is who you need to be. And, and at first David's like, okay, I'll try it. Yeah, that sounds good, whatever. I'm, I'm gonna go out there. And then he realizes like, I can't fit this armor. This isn't gonna work. I'm, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna die. <laughs> and it says in verse 39 that David took him off. He said, I can't go in these. Imagine the courage, if you're just a little shepherd coming from a field, talking to the king, that David's like, I can't do it this way. I don't want your armor. I can't, I can't be who I'm not. If, if David had been worried about impressing people, if he had let others identify and define him, he would have gone into battle in a way that wasn't who he was, in a way that God never intended. God knew what he was doing in preparing it. In verse 40, it tells us that David took his staff and then he chose five smooth stones from the stream. We don't know exactly why. Some people say it's because Goliath had brothers. We don't know if that's accurate or not. But he put him in a pouch of his shepherd's bag and with his sling in his hand, he approaches the Philistines. How does David go into battle? He goes into battle as himself, who God made him to be mostly as a shepherd. Because up until that point, that's all he had known. And so he said, I know how to use this thing. And so God, I'm gonna trust you that you're gonna use this little tool to, to do some damage on this Philistine. David had a story, he had a skill set. He had preparation up to that point and he embraced those things. Can I encourage somebody in the room? You have a story and you have a skill set. Embrace those things that God has placed in your life and run with that and let God use that in a way that, that contributes to his purpose, glorifying him, walking with him. Don't run from the things, the gifting that God has placed in your life. You know, for somebody, I just felt like I was supposed to say this, for somebody in the room, man, I just want to encourage you, and I'm not saying this in like a, like a mean way, but I just want to encourage you, get out of the seat and do something for God. Like maybe somebody hurt you or did something or whatever, and so you've just been, been in the seat at church for years, man, and, and you used to be so involved. Get out of the seat and, and start serving the Lord again. There's purpose in your life still, whether you're 67 or 16. Walk with the Lord, let him use those giftings. David remembered his story. He remembered how God had equipped him with certain skills to do the, 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 the role that God had given him. He, what I'm trying to say is David had been faithful with a little as a shepherd with his sheep, with the flock, and it enabled him to be faithful with much as a warrior and ultimately in the future as a, as a king, the king of Israel. God was always preparing for the next thing in his life. There's always different struggle, but God works through the years in his life. And, and here's what's interesting. David's brothers, Saul, King Saul, his brothers, his own dad, they didn't speak life over him. They didn't affirm his anointing. We have no record of that. Saul tries to kill him. His brothers, we read what one of his brothers thought. <laughs> and remember that his dad didn't even bring him out of the field when Samuel's there looking for the anointed one. 
He wasn't the obvious one. He wasn't the oldest one. And I would submit to you today, and there's some scholars that talk about this, that it's likely with what we know of David that, man, he carried a father wound for many years because he was not seen as much. And, and, and he gets to this moment of anointing and he's like, really, all my brothers were already here? Even after he was acting king, serving as king so many years later, I, I read one scholar that says this, after David had already been king for years, in 2 Samuel chapter five, it says this, Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent envoys to David, along with carpenters and stonemasons, logs and all that, and they built a palace for David in Jerusalem. And it says, then David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. There's people that would say that this was a moment where a king was recognizing a king and saying, hey, no matter what your dad said, no matter what the past king said, no matter what your brother said, you really are called to this. And so step into it and walk in it and see what God does in your life. I wanna just encourage some people in the room today that people who walk in the purpose of God should recognize that every other person has purpose that God created them with. And as a believer, I just wanna encourage every person in the room, your identity has to first be rooted in Christ and he will use multiple things and moments in your life to reveal his purpose and, and, and this hope that we should be walking in every day as a child of God. Somebody today, man, you're, you're in here and you say, yep, I, have, I haven't faced it in a long time or even thought about it, but I have some kind of father or mother wound in my life and it's affected the way that I've led my family. It's affected the way that I've treated people. It's affected the way that I've parented. I, I believe that God wants to heal some people of that today and he wants to solidify your identity 100% as a child of God, not Harry or David or Sally or whoever your mama was. Yes, you're their child, but ultimately you're a child of the most high king. I love at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in the book of Mark, and I'm gonna pray for you in just a minute, but in the book of Mark, before Jesus ever went to be tempted in the wilderness, before he ever went into his public ministry, before any of that happened, he gets baptized and his father in heaven says these words, you are my son whom I love and with you I'm well pleased. And I just felt like today I was supposed to share that over some people that you're, you're, you've been around for a long time or maybe you're young, but there is still something deep within you that you have not fully grasped that, that as you walk with Jesus and you receive his grace, those are now his words over you, that you're my son, you're my daughter, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. And here's the thing on top of that, my grace, just like Paul wrote, is sufficient for you in every day of your life. My identity is a child of God that is loved by God, and I know that he is well pleased with me. In fact, if you're a parent in the room, you should start to say that over your kids. Hey, you're my son. Man, I love you. I'm pleased with you. I believe that God's got great things in store for you. So whatever place you find yourself in this morning, maybe there's, there's some moments of discontent. Maybe there's some distraction in your life. I believe that God's gonna help you. Maybe identity has just been a struggle for you. I wanna challenge you, man, you're a child of God. When you make a decision to follow Jesus, you, be, you are now grafted into the family and you become a child of God. One last thought, and I wanna pray for you. This, this is something I've, I've brought up a couple other times before. In Psalm 23, one of David's greatest Psalms, many of us in the room have it memorized. There, toward the end of that Psalm, there's a line that says, surely your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Psalm 23 is so awesome and, it, and it's so beautiful because it's David reflecting on every season of his life. The Hebrew language that's used in this Psalm is way better and deeper than what the English brings out. But there's moments from David as a shepherd, your rod and your staff, there's moments from David as a warrior, and there's moments from David as a king. And so when he's looking back at his life and he's saying, man, I know that God has always been there. I know my identity. He's saying, surely your goodness and your mercy. Here's the idea with that statement in context in the Hebrew language. It's this idea that an army, when one army was in retreat, another army in the ancient Near East, they wouldn't just say, woohoo, we won. They would run after them and completely overwhelm and annihilate them. That's what they would do. 
here's what God is saying. And, and, and the other thing is, is your goodness and mercy is not really that great in the English. What it really is saying is God's faithfulness to his covenant to all people and his loving kindness. So what, what's happening at the end of this Psalm is David is saying, God, I understand that just like when I was a warrior, that your faithfulness to your promises and your covenant with me and your loving kindness, your mercy toward me, they are bent on completely, like not annihilating, but overwhelming me every day of my life. In other words, as a believer today, walking with the Lord, you should know that no matter how far you run from God, he is bent on overwhelming you with his faithfulness to his covenant and, 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 and his loving kindness in your life. So whether you're near or far today, God's gonna keep pursuing you. And somebody in the room today, you know that because you're like, I don't even know how I got to church today, but I just felt like I should, I should go. I don't even know why I saw the Bible on the other side of the room that I haven't looked at in 12 years. That's God pursuing you. I don't even know why that person all of a sudden is back in my life. There's there's gonna be moments in your life where God is always pursuing you and trying to get back in your life, trying to let you know, I am your father, walk with me, I'll change your life. I, whoo, that's the God that you serve. He's a good father, he's a good shepherd, he's a good king. 